Kia ora koto, ko Douglas Walker, toko ingwa. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome back David Houston um, for our scholarship physics session. So this session will run for about two hours and hopefully it'll be really useful for you. You'll be able to watch it back afterwards on the same link um, that you're watching it on just now. Um, if you've got any questions throughout the presentation, please do use the chat um, and I'll either ask David the question directly or I might hold on to it for a, a, a suitable point um, to ask him some of those questions. Um, thanks, um, David, for all the work that you've put into this ahead of time. And I think we're quite well, we're very lucky to have David with us, um, as I don't think there'd be many people more suited to running a scholarship physics session in the country. Um, thank you also to Study It, um, a forum that you can go on and um, ask questions relating to your subject, your NCA subject, um, for helping us to um, get these webinars out this year. All right, without further ado, David, over to you. Thanks, Doug, and welcome everybody who's watching it live and those who will probably watch it later. Um, so this is going to be uh, fairly, well, not interactive, but it's going to re require you to be able to do some stuff while we go through this presentation. So you will need some equipment, paper, pen, some digital device or something that you might be writing on, um, something to write with, basically. Um, and any other tools that you might need to be able to do your physics, formula sheets, um, uh, paper, pen, uh, calculator, etc. So um, let's just go through some uh, rudimentary stuff to start with. Um, so um, I'm going to be putting some questions to you as we go through this. So there'll be times where I'm very quiet. I'm going to uh, mute myself and, and turn my video off. Uh, so that'll be a signal to you to be actually be working on these things. Obviously, in two hours, I've got lots and lots of problems to do, um, and so we'll be going at some pace. Um, that means that if you are watching it live, um, then uh, you you may want to want to think, okay, well, I've I've looked at that, but I want to come back to that later. If if you're watching this sort of asynchronously, um, then you might want to pause and give yourself some more time. So depending on how you're watching it. Um, just be mindful of the fact that there will be times we are actually thinking is required and obviously I've got a limited amount of time uh, and so you need to control that. Um, so I'll ask you to work on some problems um, and then I'll share the solution with you. Um, and I'll go through that reasonably quickly um, because of what I've just said and also because um, I'm going to move on to the other problems and you're able to come back and have a little bit more close, a little bit closer look at what's going on. So. Okay, so here is the first problem. Uh, it's um, so I'm going to I'm going to intersperse these problems and talk about strategies and talk about some of the stuff that comes up in scholarship and all the things that you that might might help you to, to be more successful. Uh, so here is the first problem. I'm going to I'm going to talk this one through a little bit more because it's the first one, um, and I want to acknowledge um, the person who wrote a number of these problems. It's a man called Paul Hewitt. He's a very famous physics educator from America. Um, and uh, if you're interested in looking at his different types of problems, you can look them up on the internet. They're called Next Time Questions. Um, and so here's one. Um, so you've got two smooth tracks of equal length, and they've got bumps in them, as you can see. A bump and B's bumps are very similar, but you know, they're obviously a, a reflection of each other. So you've got two balls. They both start with the same initial speed. And we've got two questions here. The first one is the ball to complete the journey first is going which track, A or B, or do they both get there at the same time? That's the first part. Then the second part, so the second part of this is if the initial speed is two meters per second um, of both the balls, obviously, and the speed at the bottom of the curve on track B, so the one that is downwards curving, is three meters per second right at the bottom. Then what is the speed of the ball? at the top of the curve on track A? Is it one metre per second? Is it more than one metre per second? Or is it less than one metre per second? So I'm going to give you sort of uh, not too long to think about this, um, but uh, and then we'll I'll quickly tell you about the answer and we'll move on, but it might be one that you might want to come back to.
Okay, I haven't given a huge amount of time. Um, so uh, if you want to look away and <laughs> not see what the answers are, um, I'll briefly um, discuss them. I guess you have to <laughs> not listen as well. Also acknowledge that Doug's um, kindly put a link to Paul's concept questions up there on the uh, in the description of the YouTube video. So thanks for that, Doug. Um, so let's have a quick look. So uh, track B uh, will win the race effectively because the ball is going faster at all points than it is on track A, um, and so it will win the race. And in B, um, well, the second part of the question, um, it actually won't make the top. Um, it won't even make the top of the, the curve. And um, and there's an important discussion in here about um, a, a conservation law that we need to look think about. Speed is not conserved here, but kinetic energy is, um, and we'll certainly be coming back and talking about uh, conservation of energy. Okay, so I'll move on quickly. Okay, so maybe onto so a little bit more less exciting things, but things that are important to know. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what to expect in the exam, uh, the structure of the paper, and the nature of the questions, obviously. Um, so past results have indicated the average mark for this examination is, is quite low. Um, and performance generally across uh, the number of candidates who sit it, which is you know, in excess of 1,000, um, is generally reasonably poor. Um, obviously, 3% of students are, are supposed to gain scholarship, and those results have been very consistent for physics for a very long time. Um, so, and that works out to be around about 250 candidates. It depends on how many people do level three, um, but that's approximately correct. Uh, in some recent examiners' reports, in fact, many of them um, over the years have indicated that um, there's an enormous percentage of students who sit this exam. So, typically, that can be 13, 15, uh, even higher percentage um, of the total cohort. So, there's a lot of people out there that are, that are sitting this exam. Um, many of them are unprepared, given the fact that you're watching this. Hopefully, you're not in that category because you need to be prepared for what is a very challenging examination. But the point of the examination is to try and find the top 3%. So it doesn't actually matter how hard this thing is. If you get in the top 3%, then you will actually gain scholarship. And obviously, if you get, get in the top um, tiny fraction, um, get in the top 30 or so, then you get outstanding performance. This is a question um, that uh, is often asked about what knowledge is required. So this this does differ for some subjects. I was uh, I, I had a quick look at uh, Dr. Suzanne Boniface's equivalent talk um, uh, through this series on chemistry scholarship, and some of you might have uh, might be studying scholarship chemistry. Um, and in there, it is everything in the achievement standards at level two and three, but not in physics. So it is only content that is relevant to level three that can be assessed in level two. So, for example, something like uh, if, you've, if you've done level two waves and you've studied concave mirrors, that's extremely unlikely to be examined in uh, scholarship physics. And if it was, they would have to provide you with the requisite information for you to be able to answer the questions. So I'll give you an example of what that might look like. Um, so here's a, a question from a long time ago um, about magnetic fields. So the relationship at the top there, uh, B is mu or I over 2 pi R, is actually a relationship that is given in level one physics. Um, and some of you might remember this is to do with what is the magnetic field due to a current carrying wire. And it, and it um, changes as a function of how far you are away from the wire. It decreases. And F equals BIL is a relationship that if you've done the level two um, magnetism standard, electromagnetism standard, you'd be familiar with. But you might not have that information directly in your head. Uh, you might be familiar with it. And so you can see here that the examiner has actually provided you with some information to allow you to explain why there is a force on that loop. Um, so they've given you some information. So the exact details of being able to problem solve and things like that, uh, may not be required, but the information um, would be given to you to be able to do that. So don't 
focusing on on level two stuff, focusing on stuff that is actually to do with level three uh, and waves mechanics uh, and electricity and magnetism and the modern physics stuff. And I've got a particular section of this talk about the modern physics stuff because it's often an area where people just avoid it. Um, and there are, you know, it is part of this examination normally. Um, so we'll cover that as well, but as those four standards. Technically, stuff could come out of 3.1 about uncertainties and things like that, but there have never been any questions about that. So, um, and, and the technical details of that are unlikely to be examined other than you knowing about, you know, um, how experiments are carried out and, and maybe those general ideas about uncertainties, um, not about calculating them, um, but that measurement come with, you know, all measurements have an uncertainty associated with them. So uh, structure of the papers, so um, a long time ago the exam had six questions, then it went to five, and it's been four uh, since 2020, so I guess you can anticipate there being four, it can, um, and it, I think that that's what's indicated by NZQA, that it can range from, um, potentially if you go down to three, but I would expect that things will continue with four, um, but that's not a big deal, and I'd imagine most of you are very familiar with the way this is marked. Remembering that um, you know, typically the cut score for scholarship physics is um, a half plus one um, with four questions. Uh, a half of that is 16, so 17 is the, it's the cut score normally. It might be one higher than that or two higher, worst case scenario, but if the paper is relatively straightforward. But it's historically always been very consistent to be, um, you know, half plus one. Uh, so that actually means, if you look at these criteria, that you don't actually need to, to show scholarship performance any more than once across the four questions, as long as you have scored fours in the other ones, um, you actually can get three fours and five and get yourself to 17, and that actually um, is a, a pass in scholarship. So that's worth looking uh, into in terms of, you know, actually making the exam and breaking the exam down psychologically in terms of pieces that you can do because there will be questions, there always are, that are particularly challenging um, and one needs a strategy to be able to deal with that, both in terms of the physics strategies and in terms of the psychological approach to how you um, proceed with the exam. So another problem. Here it is here. Nice. So uh, Paul's... American educator, and in America, the resistor is a jaggedy line like that. Uh, so they, in New Zealand, we'd have them as little rectangles, of course. So we need to work out which one has the most current. So that one's quite a quick little problem. Um, I'll give you sort of 90 seconds or so just to think about it. Um, but if you know how to do it uh, sort of physic, you know, sort of in terms of mathematics, try also to think about this. How, how would you do this conceptually? What does the result actually indicate in terms of what is actually going on in terms of the concepts of things like voltage, current, and resistance?
Okay, so an interesting little one here. Which draws the most current? It's the other thing, which is sort of an interesting result. And in fact, you could extend this problem out to having a lot more resistors. Um, but I challenge you to think back about what I said before about how could one understand this more conceptually than um, than just applying uh, resistor rules uh, and parallel and series, um, you know, the, the 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 two basic rules that one uses about adding resistors in series and parallel. Okay, back to stuff about uh, the exam. Um, so th this is a collection of, of thoughts from various um, examiners' reports over the years about the very best students who sit this examination, so the top 30, who are always outstanding. So what do they, what do they actually bring to the party? Because what, what you need to think about is what kind of skills do you actually need? Um, and if there are things on here that you, are, you think, like, I'm not very good at that, maybe that's the kind of thing that you should be thinking about in the next four or five days um, in terms of preparation. So the first one is, is tricky, able to interpret an unfamiliar situation and context. So you may well be faced with something that you are completely unfamiliar with. Um, and many times in NCA examinations, they do that. Um, and that, what you need to bring to the party there is an ability to think like, this must be about the physics that I have been learning uh, in the last couple of years. So even though it's unfamiliar to you, and the context might be unfamiliar to you, the underlying physics must be stuff that you've taught. They cannot examine you on stuff that you have not actually um, is not part of the achievement standards. Physical insight, significant so physical across a wide variety of situations. So that's challenging, especially for people of your age, because actually having lived on the planet for longer does actually help with these things. Um, and so how do you improve on that? Really, um, it, it's experience, it's doing as many problems as you can. Uh, but some people just have more intuition. Um, and, and that's a power, that, a skill that they possess. The ability to provide full but concise explanations. Many, many times, uh, and I'll talk about space again later, uh, the examiner might have given three or four lines for a response, which means it's a fairly short response, nothing too detailed, but people will like to write you know, two or three pages. That's not actually helpful. Within those two or three pages, it is likely that you have made a mistake or contradicted yourself. Um, and so I encourage people uh, to respond with bullet points, short answers, think about what you're going to write before you write it. And I'll talk about time as well a little bit later in terms of this is not a rushed examination. Coherent and structured mathematical approaches to calculation. So this is that you, th you stop yourself before you commit to writing any mathematics down. Um, if you need working, there's usually plenty of paper at the back. You're thinking about, I need to use this relationship and maybe another one um, before you commit yourself. So taking your time and, and laying things out. Um, and obviously people, you know, go down blind alleys and think, oh, no, it's not going to work and then they have to cross it out. Well, that's fine. It's perfectly unsettable. Nobody's going to write the answers out directly. That would be unusual. Um, conceptual understanding, depth and breadth. And that's why this presentation is very much about that. I you know, many people will do these presentations and they will, and somebody like myself will go through and show you how, how to solve the problems that have been asked in the past. I'm not doing that. I'm focusing on conceptual understanding. Because if you have that, then you are far more likely to succeed in this examination. Um, mechanics is a big part of scholarship. It always has been. It probably always will be. And Newton's laws are obviously a very critical part of that. Next one, a good understanding of the practical implications of, their, of your answers and the ability to see if they make sense. So if you get a speed of, I don't know, a snail and you do some calculation and they ask you to show the speed and this thing comes out to be traveling in a sort of three times the speed of sound and it's a snail, you, may, you might need to think about that and think, well, maybe that's actually not right. Or that you get the velocity of an electron and find out it's faster than the speed of light. Uh, that also will be incorrect. And one needs to go back and actually have a look and go, hmm, I think I've done something wrong here. Um, and also the last one, which is tricky, 
and it's tied up with the concise and full but full explanations. And that is that it's obviously scholarship, so it needs more than a superficial response. It needs more than just you know a sort of very basic level response, unless the question is very much sort of just identify a concept. So here is an example of this. Um, so see, this was a question from a long time ago, a very straightforward question. It could be asked in level three. Satellite TV uses geosynchronous satellites as transmitters. Explain why satellite TV dishes on people's homes all point towards the same place in the sky. The vast majority of candidates, when asked this question, simply said, it's because that's where the satellite is. That's not, that is a superficial response. And that's the kind of response that you could get from any person who knows where the satellite is. You walk down the street and ask somebody, why is this? Presumably that's where it is. So one has to think about this actually a physics examination. You're given half a dozen or more lines. Actually, not just where is it and why, why it's there, but also the underlying physics about the fact that this thing is orbiting us for the same period must be fixed in space, must be above the equator in order for, for actually for something like TV uh, because you don't want, you, don't, you, know, you, you want to be able to put um, the receivers uh, pointing in the same direction and not having them to track some object in the sky. So you need to think about that. It is a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing, but it needs to be pointed out to people. Okay, so um, what are these skills? So I've got there in sort of speech marks, physics literacy. So this is not writing essays. Uh, this is being able to read simple statements. Um, they will be short. They've never been long-winded things. This is a physics exam. It's not a, an exercise in reading an unfamiliar text. Um, and so good reading skills and clear, simple writing strategies. Nothing more than that. Problem solving, your algebra skills need to be good. No more than that. It's not an exam in calculus. Some of the problems that in the past have been able to be solved with calculus, and there's no problem with using calculus, but there's no need. All the problems have to be solved using algebra. This is an algebra-based course. They need to be set out and well-documented, as we've talked about. And once again, this thing about conceptual understanding. So that's why today's one is really focused on that. So some other key comments from the examiner, just in general, about, um, you know, I guess we talked a little bit there before about what the top students can do. What about, um, you know, what, what are the trends and things like that? So time is, never seems to be an issue. There are far less problems than to do in level three. A level three tends to have three questions, maybe four questions in each one. Um, so, you, you know, you're talking about 12 responses. So 36 odd responses if you're doing all three. Uh, scholarship might have four questions, four responses, 16 odd responses. Might be a little bit of variation there, might be up to 20. But you've got the same amount of time, far less responses required. What's that mean? You have to think longer. The questions are harder. Um, so time is never a problem. Spending the time thinking is the problem. People need to be actually be able to do that. Don't write too much. The space provided is a very strong indicator of the length. So I have a general rule um, that the amount of space provided is twice as much as the examiner requires to write the answer down themselves. Obviously, they're an expert. Um, so if you are given four lines and write 50, then you have gone either way too far um, and gone into things that are totally unnecessary or you've completely missed the point of the question. So you need to check yourself on that. Sometimes, you know, you make a mistake, you need to use the back. That's absolutely fine, but just think about that. Use key ideas as a structure of an explained answer. So bullet points. I encourage people to do bullet points, and it, and it depends on, on the type of examination. And some people find it difficult to, to make links between things when they're bullet pointed. Um, but you might be, when you're thinking about responding, you might note those as bullet points, maybe at the back or something, uh, that you're going to build your, your short response to that. And the last one, which is something that uh, even the most experienced of um, problem solvers struggle to do, and that is to try and resist reaching for the equations before thinking through the problem. 
You need to spend more time thinking. That's a key message that I'm giving you. Spend more time thinking and less time writing with the pen. Because it might be not in your best interest. Okay, so how do we achieve all these things? Well, we're, going, we're focusing on conceptual understanding and you should do the past questions as many as you can. There's no secret to this. If you want to get better at something, you just have to do more of it. Okay, so I'm going into a, a, a separate part um, of this, which is, which is obviously linked to the first part, and that is about how, how do we get these successful strategies and what kind of tools, what's going to be in your kit? What's going to be in your basket of knowledge and skills that you're going to be able to draw upon? So this was a slide that, that well, I, I did a bit of a, a poll with a group of people about what were the most useful tools that could be used to solve physics problems. And you've probably seen these things before, the, one, the words with um, that are bigger are the ones that people use more often. So you can see in there, no surprise, things like conservation, Newton, laws, energy, motion, vectors, momentum, um, are, are big words in this. So there's, there's content and there are skills um, that what we need to focus on. And I've, and I've picked some problems that are going to try and encourage you to think about these in more detail and to make you focus in on those sort of things. So the highly effective tools, conservation laws, it's a fundamental thing to physics. It's what makes physics different from a lot of other things. Uh, we have conserved quantities such as energy, charge, mass, uh, momentum, angular momentum. The use of diagrams, very, very powerful. Okay, lots of diagrams were given to you. But these could be force diagrams. Um, they, they could be you know, motion graphs. They could be lots of different sort of diagrams. Diagrams. I mean, the classic one is the Doppler effect. Very difficult to explain the Doppler effect without using a good diagram. The diagram is much more powerful than the words. Concepts like vectors and components, very, very useful, and especially in mechanics. Um, obviously, we have our relationships, which are very, very powerful. And this thing which sits out on the side, this idea of physical insight. So that, you know, and that's the thing that is, you know, as I said before, something that's a little bit of function of age. Some people have more of it than others, but you can develop it by doing more and more problems. So, back to a problem. So, so I'll just actually I'll just go back. So, these problems that we're going to do now are going to be focusing on on these ideas. So, I want you to think about these ideas: conservation law, diagrams. That this is all that's going to be involved. There's not going to be much problem solving in here. There's one particular question that I want people to do, and we'll spend quite a lot of time on that. Um, and that one, you know, I'll give you, I'm not quite sure how long I'll give you. I'll just have to check out the times and, and decide. That one will be more of a, a, a traditional problem solving. That's the only one we're going to do like that. These other ones that we're going to do are going to be more of you thinking, but using these ideas, conservation laws particularly in this section. Okay, so here's this one. Um, beautiful problem. So I'll give you a little bit of time to think about this.
Okay, so that's a beautiful problem. Um, and can be very easily solved, um, though, if one realises that there is something that is conserved in the system. The thing that's conserved is energy. So, the answer is they all strike with the same speed. So that's actually a challenging problem when you start thinking about, you know, it in terms of, uh, say, forces or momentum or other ideas in physics. Um, but in fact, the idea of the fact that um, the ball, in all cases, has the same kinetic energy and the same potential energy room release, so on impact must have the same kinetic energy because the potential energy has gone to zero, means it must have the same velocity, um, is actually a very, very powerful idea. So um, one can strike through all the, the technical difficulties and the, the confusion that can be had from things going up and down and sideways and some travelling further to the right and not as far, etc. Um, by just thinking about that one beautiful idea. Okay, so I'm going to go past this one, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to come back to that problem. So this is the the next one. This is a very famous problem, um, and I want you to think deeply about this. So this, and I will lead you in terms of saying, I want you to think about conservation laws here. Also, one of the things that that I haven't talked about is that is that this is simplify problems. So in this problem. Um, most of you are very familiar with this context. We've played with something like this. Um, we, we're not particularly interested in the fact that the ball will obviously start to drop. So, um, you know, the classic story about physicists, you know, we just try and keep things as very simple as possible. Why? Because actually nature is very difficult. Um, and so that's why we make those assumptions. So let's just assume that this thing's going around uh, in a horizontal circle, which just makes it a little bit more straightforward and don't get diverted. And think about the conservation laws that are involved here. Um, and, and also think about your own physical experience. What, what, what do you remember about what happens? And can you reconcile that with, with what the physics might be telling you? Because those two things might be in contradiction. I will come back to the previous problem uh, a little bit later.
Okay, so I'm having a little look in the chat and seeing some interesting ideas there. So this is a classic problem that, that catches many, many people out. Because it's very tempting um, to simply say, well, well, angular momentum must be conserved. Angular momentum is the product of mass and velocity and the radius. The radius is getting smaller. So the velocity must increase because from and and that seems perfectly consistent with what our physical experience of our physical experience has this thing which appears to be going faster, but of course it's traveling a shorter distance. So what actually is conserved here? Somebody mentioned in the chat momentum. No, momentum is not conserved here. The only way the speed can change is if some work is done on it. And so the kinetic energy is going to be fixed here. Now the challenge is for people to actually see why is angular momentum not conserved. And that's because this ball does not act through the centre of the pole. So there are problems. There's a classic problem of an object uh, going around on an ice table when there's a hole in the middle of the table and the string goes down through the hole and there's, there's a mass on it. Um, and so one can generate situations where there, there is actually uh, no torque acting. But in this case, there is definitely a torque. Um, and so in this case, the, the conservation law that is most powerful is conservation of energy. Uh, and that there is no opportunity for the speed to actually change, so it must remain unchanged in our physical experience. And some of you in the chat talked about the fact that, um, you know, omega might appear to be changing but R is also um, altering, and so the speed stays the same. It's a really, really good problem, and it catches people out all the time because, because of that contradiction in our own minds about our own experience and what we've seen. Okay. So here's another one. It's a bit weird. Look carefully down here. I apologise. Right on here, the scale. So this is supposed to be the binding energy curve. You might not be familiar with it because it's, it's drawn upside down. Um, compared to what you might have traditionally seen, but actually this is probably a more powerful way of representing it. And we've got iron here in the middle at the last point, hydrogen right hard up against on the left-hand side and uranium. And we've got this interesting looking, looking character here and talking about uh, the decay and whether or not this decay is possible and whether or not it will generate energy or not. So once again, I really want you to focus on conservation laws here.
Okay, so this is an interesting little problem. Um, and given what's written in the chat, I'm interested about, um, and that's why I've dedicated a section a little bit later on to talk about the modern physics stuff that can come up. So this this is a graph that you might have seen. Um, it's actually in um, Pauline Bendel's ESA study guide. Uh, it's a plot of mass per nucleon as a function of uh, the nucleons, mass numbers. Um, traditionally, you have a binding energy curve, which um, is the, almost the inverse of this. So iron happens to have the least amount of mass per nucleon, and that's why it's the most stable. So this is an interesting thing uh, because, and, and I, I find it also interesting about um, oxygen going to carbon. Your reaction should be one of, hmm, does oxygen decay to carbon? Um, that would be somewhat problematic uh, if it did this uh, spontaneously. Um, we, we may have a problem. So, you're at, so there is a potential here for some intuition. Um, and some other understanding that you could bring to the party here. Is that decay possible? Yes, it does not break any conservation laws. Right? The total charge and the total mass is conserved at the top and the bottom lines of those uh, various nuclei. But does it require more energy uh, or does it, does it release energy? Well, surprisingly, uh, it requires energy. So uh, because you're going to have to go up in terms of the mass uh, per nucleon, uh, in order, and so therefore you're going to end up generating, uh, having to input that energy in order for this reaction to occur. But what I, I'm interested by the chat because people's, um, you know, and it's only a random sample of a small group of people, but um, it tends to be the way that people's understanding of ideas like binding energy are very poor. Um, and when binding energy comes up, and it has come up relatively regularly, um, uh, the examiner's reports point out that people struggle to actually respond appropriately. They get themselves confused. They start using words um, and, and, and conflate two ideas, energy and force. Uh, but they are different things. Okay? So uh, you need to quite clearly separate the ideas of binding energy from the ideas of force. Um, you, know, you, do, you don't want to define something like the binding energy um, is related to the force to pull these things apart or to put them together. This is an energy. So one has to be very careful. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the other section on, on the modern physics stuff. But a nice, interesting little problem, slightly different from, from what you might normally see. Okay, so I'm going to go back now to this problem here. So this problem is very old. It's nearly as old as me. Um, and, and it looks very boring. And it has... It's very traditional in terms of, you know, things, you know, little objects floating around with simple numbers, um, and it's broken up into three, six, seven pieces. So it was from a uh, scholarship exam many, many years ago, almost 50 years ago probably. Um, and so it would, these days this question wouldn't be asked, but there's some very important physics in here. And so I'm going to give you a considerable amount of time to try and have a hack at this. The first three parts, well, maybe the first four parts are relatively straightforward. Um, and you should be able to do them quite quickly. But it's what happens afterwards, which is very important and interesting in respect of uh, relative motion, uh, centre of mass calculations, and this idea about how do we relate physical reality to ideas like energy conservation? Because there has to be, in the laws of physics, we must be able to agree on um, some fundamental things. So, for example, in Einstein's theory of relativity, special relativity, um, he tells us that actually the, the time of observation for different observers will be different. We don't agree on the time. But we have to agree on the event that happened. That's, that's why, um, you know, we, that uh, we have to have a speed limit in the universe. And it happens to be tied to the speed of light um, because we have to actually be able to agree that actually events occurred um, 
or else we would have uh, you know, a very awkward situation about causality. So this is, that's a very esoteric sort of topic, but this is tied to it. So I, I don't know. I'm going to get – it'd be useful if people pop things in the chat as they're going, see how we're getting on, and maybe Doug can help us with that. Um, those who are watching this asynchronously, you can just pause and take your time to do this. Um, I'm probably thinking at least 15 minutes to have a good crack at this problem. Um, and um, and we can work our way through it and then talk a little bit about um, what comes out of this.
Okay, so I've had a look at the chat, some interesting um, comments, and it's very likely I've run this question many times with many different groups of students. Um, so where to start? Well, there's some pretty big hints in this problem about the fact of which conservation law one has to use. So we're talking about it's on a horizontal sheet of ice. Um, so we're looking at conservation of momentum here. Now, obviously the other um, conservation law that will be appropriate is conservation of energy. And conservation of energy is very powerful. Um, but it's problematic when it comes to things like collisions. So if we're talking about uh, something like a classical um, you know, head-on collision where the objects come at the same velocity, they're the same mass, and they collide, one possible situation there is that they just stop. So if you consider the, the energy in that system, the energy um, using conservation of energy is going to be problematic, especially... Um, uh, if you then want to consider things like what happens if, if they don't stop and then they bounce off each other. Um, so in this situation, let's stick to conservation of momentum and we have to work out the X and Y components. Um, and the situation is set up very simply with some very nice numbers uh, that will allow you to calculate this. So we have something going along the x-axis, travels at a speed of 5 meters per second, so it has a momentum 5 kilogram meters per second, and something that is traveling a little bit slower but has more momentum coming in the y-axis at 12. Um, and so they, so the total momentum will have those components. So I'm just going to flip to, to the answer sheet um, and, and show that uh, first uh, part. Maybe I'll just turn on the little Elizabeth, um laser pointer thing. So here we go. We've got uh, this object here traveling. And this one here, so this one's obviously going a little bit slower, but it has more momentum, a little faster. Uh, and they're going to collide at, uh, at some point, which we will call the origin. So one can do this um, using things called vectors, uh, column vectors, which you can use. Now, this is not the only way to represent it. It's just an easy way to do it. Uh, that is actually taught, not, not taught in school mathematics. But it's a very powerful um, piece of mathematics that is usually reserved to... Um, first year university mathematics, but it's very simple. It all it does is points out that these are this is the x point and this is the y five and zero add to zero and twelve, and you get a total momentum of five in the x direction, positive, and twelve in the y direction. And you can calculate that and work out the angle, but you don't need to worry about the angle. So B, uh, let's just go back to the question. B says what are the x and y velocity components of the centre of mass? So obviously the centre of mass is on a line between these two bodies, and it's going to be closer to the three kilogram one than the one kilogram one because obviously it has more mass. And one can calculate that using uh, the, the standard equation one is given: uh, x1 m1 plus x2 m2 over the total mass. What I'm interested in is what's going to happen to the centre of the mass of the system. It's going to travel up through here through to the origin, and then it is going to continue in that same straight line motion because there are no external forces here. So momentum is conserved, so that means that the velocity of the centre of mass is unchanged. That's a powerful idea. The velocity of the centre of mass is unchanged. It's just going to travel through this very simple linear path up at some angle, look like this, going that direction. So we can work out the um, centre of mass velocity. It'll just be the total momentum divided by the total mass, and you can turn this five twelve thing into you know into thirteen. Um, and um, because it's just a right angle triangle, very simple one, five twelve thirteen triangle. Uh, and uh, we can see that the x component of the centre of mass is one point two five meters per second. So this this little point here, I'm putting my pointer where the centre of mass is, is moving at a velocity of 1.25 to the right and 3 up. It's connected to these 5 and 4s, but then obviously it's not the same. So C then asks, 
what's the total kinetic energy? Well, that's a very simple problem because we know the kinetic, we know the velocities, and we can look at it. It's 36.5 joules. And then the two things collide. Um, and but what we can say is because momentum is conserved, there's no external forces, there's no frictionless surface, it's, it's flat, um, that this object is going to travel off um, with some with the center of mass velocity, because it tells you in the problem that they um, they they collide and they stick together. So I saw in the chat people talking about is this an elastic collision? Well, it's not going to be because they're going to stick together. And you think about any collision that involves things hitting each other, um, that can't be elastic. And almost all, um, certainly all, all collisions um, of objects that we are familiar with, balls and objects around us that we can see, all of those collisions are inelastic. It's only at the subatomic level that you get anything approximating an elastic collision. Uh, so. What we find is that the momentum doesn't change. It's still 13. And here is an interesting little result here. This result here, P squared over 2M. This is a powerful idea of rewriting kinetic energy as P, which is obviously MV. MV and so M squared, V squared divided by M gives you the MV squared part. And obviously you've got the divided by 2 for the half. So in here, we can see actually the kinetic energy has dropped to 21.125 joules. And if you think about this collision, just imagine it in your own in, in your own minds, two objects, you'll hear the collision. The energy is going to be dissipated. And it won't just be in this form of sound, but obviously th these things will be heated up. So what do we do now? Well, we go to E. Now we have to determine the X and Y velocity components of the combined mass. Well, we've got this object that is actually traveling, stuck together, and it's going up here. So actually now we've only got one object, and we know its momentum, it's 13, and it's exactly the same as the momentum of the center of mass, because now what we've done is we've turned the object, two objects into one object. So actually the X and Y um, the components are exactly the same as the answer to be, because we now got one object, not two. Um, now, I'm just keeping an eye on the chat in terms of what people are asking. So, um, so how do we work out the total momentum? Uh, I'm just going to go back to this because I'm just seeing a comment there. The total momentum of the system is the total mass times the velocity of the centre of mass. That's a definition. So the velocity of the centre of mass is not one of the relationships you're given on the formula sheet. It's something that you do need to know. It, it, all it is saying is if the momentum is fixed, then things travel in straight lines. No external forces, no accelerations, velocity is fixed. So it's not a new result to you. I'm sure it's not a new result to you, but you might not have seen it in that form. It's a very, very powerful idea. It's an extremely powerful idea. So velocity of center mass is total momentum over total mass. Something you need to know. So now we get into the nitty gritty, actually. You might have thought, oh, geez, this is more than I thought it was. And that is, how on earth do you work out what were the velocity components of the masses relative to the center of the mass? So you've got to imagine, imagine that you can, you're, you're on, you're, you're standing on the center of mass. This is some, this is incredibly strong um, wire that's running, but infinitely light. Um, that's not interacting with things, but it's connected to the two objects and it can shrink in some particular way. It's almost like a little balancing bar that you can stand on. And you're standing, it's a miniature version of you, and you're able to watch these two objects. So one's over your right shoulder, one's over your left shoulder and you're able to sort of scan these two things and you can imagine I hope um, that this one's getting to here uh, you know uh, a bit far a little bit slower than this guy but obviously this guy's going to travel a little bit further because they've got to they've got to collide um, and so how do you work out this idea of the relative velocity well, relative velocities are things that are always done by subtracting the velocity that you've got 
from the velocity of the thing that you are interested in. So if you're running away from something, and they're traveling at 10 meters per second, and you are traveling at 10 meters per second, then their velocity relative to you is zero, 10 minus 10. So it's always the difference between the velocities. So let's see what happens with that. So we've got to do this subtraction. It's very hard, I think, to think about how to, what velocity, you know, you're moving like this. Right? You're, you're moving like this, and in the velocity you're moving is 1.25 to the right and 3 up, and this guy's going 5 to the right, and this guy's going 4. That's very hard. And you're going to be able to hold all that information here to have a visualization. You can sort of see that it's sort of compressing, and, and these two things are rushing towards you you and you're rushing towards them, how does this all work out? Well, it's far easier just to think about the definition of relative velocity and do the subtraction, and this is what happens when you do the subtraction. The one kilogram one, which is the one that's moving just to the right, um, is moving at 3.75 to the right, as far as you're concerned, uh, and it's moving downwards. That's why the minus sign is there, okay, relative to the centre of mass, because it looks like it's coming towards you because you are stationary as far as you're concerned, and this thing appears to be getting closer and closer to you, so it must be coming towards you. So that's what the minus sign is. The velocity of the three kilogram one relative to the centre of mass, it is moving towards you. It's moving. Um, uh, it's coming closer to your right shoulder, I guess, and so it's moving in the negative x direction. This way, but it's also coming up and behind you. So that's got a positive part in terms of the y component. So we've got these two numbers. Right, now we get to the real killer thing. And it's more the result I'm interested. This is a hard problem. Uh, this would this would this would get lots and lots of students. <laughs> Big time. Um, what's the total kinetic energy relative to the center of mass before the collision? So um what you've got to do to solve that problem is you've got to work out um, the velocity of the one kilogram guy and the three kilogram guy uh, and, and add them together and you get this interesting number, which is 15.375. So what we're saying here is that we're trying to work out um, as far as you are concerned, if you're sitting on the centre of mass, what is the kinetic energy relative to you? Because when we first did it, what was the total kinetic energy? We're just looking on top of the whole system and looking at the individual parts and just adding them together from sort of an outsider's viewpoint. But now we're inside the system and we're looking at it and we don't get the same answer. C and G are totally different. And that might be slightly concerning some people. And I think, well, so we don't agree about the kinetic energy? No. Because kinetic energy has got velocity in it. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not invariant. It changes. It depends on, on the relative motion. So how is kinetic energy useful? Well, there's a very interesting relationship here. This number is 15.375. The total energy here was 36.5 and then we went and worked out what it was after the collision and got 21.125 and if you subtract 21.125 from 36.5 you get this magic number 15.375 and what's important about that well, that is the one thing we can agree on because that must be the energy lost in the collision. We can measure that. We can put a thermometer on these things. We could very cleverly, I guess, we'd have to work pretty hard, work out the energy dissipated in the sound, etc. But it is theoretically possible, and we would be able to measure that. We have to be able to agree on what happened in the collision because actually the collision is the real thing. It's a very beautiful result. Well, this, is, this is an incredibly beautiful result. We have to agree on what happened in the collision, but before that, we can have different perspectives, we can have different uh, ways of measuring things, um, but we must agree on the physical reality, and the physical reality is what's happened in the collision.
Um, so it's a toughie, but there's some beautiful ideas in here. Lots of them about momentum, conservation, conservation of energy, um, the power of kinetic energy, the, the concern about elastic and inelastic, center of mass motion, um, all of these things. Very simple little calculations, probably until we get to here. This is tricky. Certainly agree that certainly working out this part is hard to get. Once you've got this and this part is okay, you can work out how fast they're going. That's okay. Um, but that's a challenging problem. But I'm more interested in the concepts behind here. That of conservation momentum, that of centre of mass, the motion of the centre of mass, being able to calculate the various things, and then that little sting in the tail, it's a rather significant sting in the tail, of what can we actually agree upon? There must be something physically real in this system. Okay, here we're going for time, 11.26. Okay, we're looking, we're on track. That's great. So feel free to come back to that and have a good think about it. As I said, it's rather awkward. So we've done that one. Okay. So other areas of interest. Um, I want to talk about um, a couple of things that come up, one less often than the other, but one pretty always. And one's modern physics, the other one is AC circuit theory. So a lot of people don't know this, and it's been quite clear from examiner's reports that um, that there are some students out there that simply do not know or have not been taught that this stuff actually is covered in scholarship physics. So the modern physics uh, internal standard 3.5 uh, can allow schools to do really what, what they like. But in scholarship, it has been defined what the content of that is expected. And that is this stuff, the Bohr model. Uh, ideas like quantization, quantization of energy, discrete energy levels. Um, atomic line spectra, ionisation, uh, the photoelectric effect uh, that, that Einstein, part of his Nobel Prize, was about um, the photoelectric effect. Didn't discover the photoelectric effect, but he explained the physics behind it. Um, and obviously that's a big part of, of, of an understanding of the quantum world. The idea of wave-particle duality, that, I mean, that light particularly behaves in a way that seems to um, move between a wave and a particle type approach. Well, in fact, what we're really saying is that there's very little difference between waves and particles. Um, we can consider ourselves waves if we want. Um, it's just a bit easier to describe us as particles. Uh, and the last part is binding energy, mass deficit, and being able to you know, deal with questions about conservation of energy, um, mass energy, and nuclear reactions. And I'll put a little note down here. It's often assessed through an extended passage. So we're not doing an essay here, but, you know, there have been questions in the past, and I'll show you a couple, that just talk about, you know, like, look, pick a topic, photoelectric or wave up, write about it, tell us what you know. So actually, that, that if students come to the exam having studied this stuff, this is actually very straightforward. This is not a trick. There's nothing to solve. This is, do you know this stuff? And so um, it's important that people that sit scholarship physics, you know, understand, A, this could be covered, and be, you know, have some familiarity about it. And the ideas are beautiful and extremely important. Um, most of the physics that's in uh, the course is physics of, you know, Newton it's over 300 years ago. Uh, this is the stuff that is, is, is what, what we call modern physics. Most of this was actually um, discovered 100 years ago, so it's not that modern, but um, it's still extremely applicable and used um, all the time. So these very beautiful ideas. Okay, so here's some, here's some sample little questions that have been asked in the past. So there's the binding energy curve that we talked about before. So this is the one we had before was uh, upside down. It went because it had mass on the side per nucleon. Um, this one is binding energy per nucleon, and you can see here that it, it peaks out around about iron 56. Uh, a little bit of stability, a little bit of bumps in here, and you get this curving off. So you're asked to discuss the relative stability of the nuclear, right? So this is the most stable here. And, you know, but it's an interesting thing about stability. You say something like hydrogen. Hydrogen's, hydrogen has zero binding energy by definition because it's just a proton. It requires no energy to separate uh, something from itself. Um, and uh, so we're not just talking about, we're not talking about radioactive stability here. We're talking about inherent stability. Um, in terms of um, energy processes 
and energy release and energy input when you're moving between various things. So on this side, the below iron, um, this is the regime of fusion reactions, and on this side, this is the regime of fission reactions. Um, there's a little one about wave particle duality. What is meant by the term wave? And what's some evidence? So there's a variety of evidence of photoelectric effect. It's evidence that light behaves like a particle, um, things like interference, diffraction. Uh, it, it's harder to explain if the thing is, if light is a particle, but, and we tend to talk more talk about it as a wave. But as I said, that actually, that there's a convergence of ideas there when you actually start thinking about these things. But you can see these are relatively straightforward questions. And there's, you know, if you know the stuff, you can get you can get two or three um, marks in a question on this stuff. So I, I won't go into the details here, but the, the, these are the responses that were required. Um, and in, in fact, in this question here, there were four marks on an eight mark question um, about that particular topic. So you can actually you know do quite well. Um, on a particular question by just actually having studied this stuff and, and know it to a reasonable level of accuracy. Okay. AC circuit theory is another one. Comes up occasionally, not all the time. It's a closed body of knowledge. So I often tell my own students that in terms of the questions that can be asked, they are capable of being as good as I am at doing this stuff because actually it's a very set, clear, delineated piece of knowledge. There are three circuits. They don't go outside of that because, in fact, there's some technical problems when you try and introduce things like parallel circuits. You have to use complex numbers to solve those. Um, it's highly mathematical. Uh, so it lends itself to simple problem solving, and really the mathematics behind it is things like Sokotar and basic trigonometry, uh, Pythagoras, etc. So it's a good area, and once again, lots of people tend to not do it, and some schools don't offer it, um, or that they're doing other examinations uh, from different um, examination systems. So here's a very simple question that came up. You know, we've got the four components, and some sort of source, a resistor, a capacitor, an inductor, uh, and you're told the source is 12, the inductor is 15, the resistor is 7.2, and the capacitor is 5.4, and they look at this and they think, something wrong here, the inductor voltage is bigger than the source voltage. And the question is, is the voltmeter faulty? Defend your point of view. Well, if you know that, in fact, the voltage across the inductor is out of step with the voltage across the resistor and the voltage across the capacitor, it's quite possible that these three things uh, are different from this, and in fact, it's quite possible that, that this inductive voltage could be quite large. Um, um, so, and there's the response. And it's actually very straightforward. So, I guess my message here is make sure that you don't. Go into an exam where you think like, oh, they've asked a question about that. I just didn't even study it because actually that topic is relatively straightforward. Um, and, you know, that it's possible they could ask something tricky, but it's unlikely compared to the other areas. Uh, and you don't want to have a sense that you, you're sitting there thinking, damn it, I, I just don't know anything about that because you'll never be able to generate that understanding. And the understanding is relatively straightforward. Okay. So we've got. 25 minutes, and I know a couple of people have asked some questions, um, and I'm sure Doug's looking at those questions as well. Um, but let's do some more conceptual questions. Um, I see there's a question there about um, learning and reviewing nuclear physics, and I can come back to that. Um, but I've just as I finish, um, I've got, let me check how many we've got here. Um, we'll continue. Um, I've got about Maybe half a dozen short, relatively straightforward, but they're more they're, they're conceptual again. Um, from a range of topics, mechanics. Yeah, there's a few actually, so it'll take us a little bit of time. Um, so if there are going to be questions, make sure they get chucked in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll be thinking about while we're doing these. But, um, um, and Doug's also responding in terms of those questions as well. 
Um, so um, here we go. So here's the first one. Um, and given we've got 25 minutes and I've got about, yeah, so a couple of minutes on each of these. So, and these are all, there's no tricks to this. Um, but think about what's going on. Think about how you go about explaining it. What are the key ideas? Any conservation laws, diagrams? Think about those skills and those ideas that we've talked about before. How are you going to use those? Okay. So what happens to the readings on the galvanometer when the switch and circuit one is closed and kept closed and opened again? So a very traditional sort of question could be asked at level two. Nothing wrong with asking at level three or scholarship problem at all. Um, so let's have a look at, at the way Paul approached this. So for starters, use of a diagram. So we've got a magnetic field, right? So we've got a coil, we've got current flowing, we've got a coil. So when the first, let's, let's see what he says. When the switch is first closed, a current is established in coil one and creates a magnetic field. That field interacts with coil two. Um, this buildup of field induces current that is registered in the galvanometer. The current is brief because once the field is stabilised and no further change takes place, no current is induced and the galvanometer reads zero current. When the switch is open, the current ceases in coil one and the magnetic field in the coil and the, and the part that extends to coil two collapses. This change induces a pulse of current in the opposite direction. So there's things like Lenz's law here um, uh, and uh, Faraday's law in terms of in inducing um, uh, a voltage in coil two, which ultimately results in the current. Paul's emphasised the, the idea of current here, but I'll, fundamentally, what is what is first produced is obviously a voltage. Um, but how do you represent these things? So actually, diagrams are very useful in this one. That's why I kept this in here because even though this could be reasonably well asked at level two, actually, it it, it does it, it it could be asked at scholarship level in terms of the level of detail required. Um, so use of diagram, very powerful. Use of correct terminology about Faraday's law, Lenz's law in terms of the, the opposite nature of it, um, and the feedback that is going on between coil one and coil two. And it's a nice lead in to things like transformers um, and that feedback loop between those two things. I think a lot of people would try and answer that question without the use of a diagram, and I actually think that the use of the diagram actually makes it really good. Okay, so this one is a little bit more tricky. It's based around similar physics. And actually, somebody's asked a good question about, you know, what do you do if you're completely stuck? So uh, in this one, you might be completely stuck. And it's fine. Um, 
and we'll have a discussion about that as well. Okay, so this is more tricky. So an electric saw running at normal speeds draws a relatively small current. But if a piece of wood being sawed jams and the motor shaft is prevented from turning, the current dramatically increases and the motor overheats. Which is a surprising thing, but it's absolutely true. So somebody asked, um, Andre, um, asked about, you know, what happens if you get completely stuck? So... First of all, try and identify what somebody suggested talking about concerts. Well, actually, even bigger. This is about electricity. What is this about? What, what What's in a motor? What are the key words? So actually, this is about a motor. What's in a motor? A motor's got lots of wire in it. So, and there's current flowing in there. So actually trying to unpick and getting rid of all the extraneous information. This thing is not about him soaring it. Um, this is about the fact that when it's running, it it has low current, and then all of a sudden the current increases and what's going on, and tying it back to a motor. So actually being able to filter out is incredibly powerful. So let's have a look at the response. So electric current in the windings of the motor are from two sources. You might think, well, two sources. What's that? The external current input that forces the windings to turn. Yeah, we put current into a motor and the internal back current generated by the turning windings. Because, of course, you've got current flowing through wires in a magnetic field that actually will produce um, its own current. So you might have done a little experiment where, uh, for example, you have a little little turbine that you can turn with your hand, a little, little power, little, little little generator, and your teacher might have said to you, well, now just turn it and, and, we'll, and now try it and we'll put it across a light bulb and we can make the light bulb go. That's great. The clever trick is to do is to take the, the two alligator clips and clip them together, no light bulb, and try and turn the handle and you'll find hmm, that's way harder. That's what's happening in this case as well because, in fact, motors are generators and generators are motors, physically the same thing. So an electric motor is also a generator. The net current is the input current, what you put in, Minus what is generated by the fact that you've got current flowing through wires in a magnetic field. So when the motor jams, the net current is greater because of the absence of the generated current. Okay, so it stops 
So what's happening is what you're really getting when you're putting that piece of wood through there is actually a reduced current because in fact you don't get uh, you don't get out in terms of you don't you don't get the current you think you will you always get less. And obviously it's not rated to have that high current because it's rated to be used. And if it goes on for too long, then you get the situation. Um, so Paul makes an interesting comment there that your bill from your power company is the net current. So if you generate more than you take in, the power company gives you a rebate, gives you some money back. Um, okay. So some mechanics-y ones. So this one a little bit, oh, I think we'll go a bit faster on this one. So this one sort of uh, can get people pickled. Which encounters the greater force of errors or something? A falling elephant or a falling feather? Now, is this one of these questions where it's like, oh, well, the feather won't fall very fast. That must be the answer, and it's pretty obvious, but is there a trick to this or something? Is it one of those sort of questions? Um, well, yeah. Let's have a look. Because what the most important part here was which in, in, which encountered the greater force, the greater amount of force. The elephant might win the race, but the effect on the elephant that the amount of force involved is significant. So there is a greater force of air resistance on the falling elephant, which plows through more air than the feather in getting to the ground. The elephant encounters several newtons of air resistance, which compared to its huge weight, has practically no effect. We don't notice it. Only a small fraction of a newton acts on the feather, but the effect is significant because the feather only weighs a fraction of a newton. Be very careful about these sort of, sort of questions, right? So that one's a little trick. A little trick. Uh, well, it should have been focused on the greater force. Okay. So here's another ear resistance one, which is a little bit more tricky. You found the previous one tricky. This one, so, yeah, maybe. But what I want you to do in this one is think about your own physical experience, okay, of throwing things up. Some things that behave nicely, other things that behave less nicely. Some things that are more affected by ear resistance than not.
Okay. So people are thinking hard, I can tell. So the thing to solve this problem is to think about taking something like a feather and trying to throw it into the air and how long it will take to get to the top and then how long will it take to get down. If you take an extreme case, that's a very powerful tool as well in physics, take an extreme case. So you throw up a feather, it won't take very long to get to the top, a long time to get down. So why is this? So it's only true when air resistance is negligible because the air resistance is not the same going up and going down because air resistance depends on a few things, one of which is obviously like with, uh, with our elephant, how, how big the thing is, like how big Paul describes it, how much air you've got to plough through, but also the speed. So if you're throwing the thing up, it's obviously going at high velocity to start with. It experiences a large air resistance force. Um, and But on the way down, of course, it's going very slowly. Um, so it's a little bit tricky to have a look at that. So given the time, we've only got six months left, and I'd like to give you a couple more. Um, so here's another one. Maybe I'll start on the line this time. And we'll just work through these things. And so this one's about things landing on the ground, a little bit, hopefully a little bit easier. Two identical spring-loaded dart guns are simultaneously fired straight down. One fires a regular dart, the other a weighted dart. So you can see the weighted dart there on the right. Which dart hits the ground first? The regular dart, the weighted dart, it's a tie. So, the regular dart. So, the energy in the springs will be fixed, and the same amount of force on the darts. But the regular dart has less inertia, or you, we would more commonly say it has less mass, and therefore has a greater acceleration in the game. So, it emerges with a greater speed and wins the race. So just using those ideas about, um, you know, that 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 because that the thing is conserved in terms of what can actually happen to the two objects, that the determining factor here is the mass of the things that it's acting on, and therefore we can apply Newton's second law and actually see that the acceleration while while the interaction is happening will be less um, for the heavier thing, and so it won't go as fast in the end. Okay, here's another one. So we've got two blocks. This is a surprising result. So you could apply this to something like a bungee jump. And in fact, this physics wasn't, well, this physics was unknown, but in fact, people hadn't thought about this until about 20 years ago and thought about what's actually going on here and actually had a look at things like bungee jumping has, has relevance to this. So you've got two blocks, they're identical. One is free to fall. A, B is attached to a massive chain. So it's, that, that chain there is heavy. It's not a light thing. Um, and the question is, when dropped, both blocks hit the floor below um, a vertical distance equal to the length of the chain. So there's no sort of trick in terms of that the chain is some unusual length. Which one hits first? And we can assume here there's no sort of air resistance or anything like that involved. These things are just being dropped. And it's a relatively short distance and they're relatively heavy. You can see they're relatively small as well. Just with the um, uh, the time, David, there's a few yeah. questions that I did want to throw your way that the students have asked. 
Yeah. So this um, is the last, this is the last question, Doug. Awesome. Okay. So I'll just give you a moment after that, and I'll fire the questions your way. Yeah. Hopefully, I can respond. Thank you. So this one's interesting, right? Um, which block hits first? So it's B. The block B hits four. Notice that the race isn't between blocks A and B, but between A and the end part of the B chain system, which isn't in free fall because one end is fastened to the post, so it doesn't accelerate at G like block A. Block B's change... Block B chain's centre of mass initially closer to the floor accelerates less than G, but acceleration of its free end increases and falls surpassing G. So actually, when you do bungee jumping, the surprising result, if you drop something at the same time and there was no air resistance and things like that, you would you would get there before the thing you dropped. Um, and it's a little bit like a, a falling pole, the end of which um, accelerates faster than G. Um, so a bit of a surprising result. So a bit, little bit out there, that question. That's where I thought it sort of finished with sort of just something a little bit sort of quirky. The things are never quite as simple as, as we would like them to be. Um, but one can look at the centre of mass of that system and think about it. Um, so hopefully that stuff was useful and Doug's got some questions. So I'll I'll stop. Sh shall I stop sharing my PowerPoint, Doug, I think? Yeah, that's probably appropriate, David. Um, and... Um, I've really enjoyed the, the discussion, both from yourself, David, and also in the chat. Um, and apologies if I've been distracted at times answering those bits, and I might have missed things that you'd already said. But just to just to recap, some of the questions that came up. Uh, maximum number of questions in the scholarship paper? Technically, it can be six. And it's most recently been four. Oh, I think you, uh -huh. and it's, ne it's never gone, it's, it's only ever gone down. It wasn't six. It was six a long time ago. It was five, and then it's been four. So the trend is less, not more. And an NCA, that's been the trend. So I, I think everybody can be pretty confident that it's not going to be any more than four. It could be cool. three. I think it's defined as not being less than three. I don't think you can do it. Yeah. Um, there was a really good question about um, resources for learning nuclear physics. Um, I've suggested, you know, depending on what resources you've got from your school, your workbook um, or education perfect. Um, is there anything else that you would recommend, David? Um, I think um, the ESA study guide, Pauline's book, is, is, is good. It's got um, your explanations are good. The notes are clear and straightforward and covers covers everything correctly, I believe. Um, uh, I think Mark Stanley's stuff on No Brain Too Small. Um, is probably pretty good. We could have a quick look and just see what that looks like. Let me, have, let me just have a quick look and just see um, what Mark's stuff looks like. I, I think one can go uh, one can go crazy in terms of um, that part because it's a little bit unknown. Um, but I think that if you go to No Brain Too Small and look at the modern physics part, um, Mark's got a document there, um, which is pretty extensive. It's about eight pretty dense pages. I, I wouldn't be going out of, outside of that. And in fact, he goes on and does a little bit about special relativity and general relativity, um, but you can stop at binding energy. So Mark's stuff would be great if you don't have ESA or you don't have Education Perfect or you've got some funded thing. Um, no Brain Too Small is an amazing resource done completely free by Mark and Joe Stanley. So, Kapai, thank you. Mark's a, Mark's a very good physicist, and I'm sure it's it's correct. Um, and uh, Andre had asked what to do in a question in scholarship if you're stuck. So what's your advice, David? I think that um, leaving it, what, what often people in exams, people tend to, to start at question one, right? Question one might be the hardest thing in the paper. <laughs> um, you know, so um, my generation were brought up on exams where we had 10 minutes of reading time. We had three hours plus 10 minutes. That 10 minutes was very valuable. I would, given that time is not on the show, I'd read through all the questions and go, okay, I'm going to do question four because that one's about centre of mass stuff and I've been doing lots of stuff about that and I feel confident. We know from psychometrics that students get most of their grades within the first hour, hour and a quarter in an exam that's three hours long. Right. Most of the marks they actually generate because you're fresh, you've got a lot of adrenaline, you know, things are really going well, 
Um, so doing the thing you're best at, he might see an AC circuit. Oh, good, AC circuit theory. I want to do that because I know that stuff and it's pretty closed. Do those things first. So then you're left with a situation where you've got something that you really don't know what it's, you know. I mean, you've got to start narrowing it down and, um, and actually going, what is this about waves? You know, almost start at that fundamental level and actually trying to, you know, you'll be able to do that relatively quickly and then start noting down what concepts might be involved in this, what relationships are there out there, are they, are they, are these questions about explaining, are they calculating? Um, and, um, you know, traditionally the explain questions are harder than the calculation ones, students find them more difficult. Um, but um, often, certainly in the last few years, scholarship physics questions, all of them have had elements in them that are very accessible to even average level three students. So there was a question a few years back, um, you know, what does the plus and minus mean in the Doppler equation? Well, all our level three students should know that. So nobody should get that wrong. So there's always going to be something in there that you should be able to try and pick out, even if the question is really difficult, trying to get two or three marks in the question. Um, you know, might be the difference because you might have done well on the other questions. So definitely don't give up on them. Um, and also have this, you know, it's a piece of advice I was told by a professor a long time ago, that, you know, it's got to be about stuff you've been taught. You know, if you've got a good physics teacher, they will have taught you all the material that you need. So it's not like you're going to have to generate something new. So you have to have some a, a little bit of confidence that this isn't all of a sudden some thing that you've never heard of, even if it's about something you've never heard of, it's not really about that. The context is something in front of the, the physics. So if it's about, I don't know, surfing, and you don't know anything about surfing, it's not about surfing, it's probably about waves, or it's probably about mechanics, right? And it's, oh, it's about momentum or whatever. So I think having that, just that confidence to say, actually, it's got to be doable. It might be hard. But it actually can be; it must be able to be solved. Um, that's probably about the extent of my advice on it. It's, it's you know, what did Feynman say about solving problems? You stare at them for a very long time, and then the answer comes into your head. Hopefully, you know, hours is long enough to stare at them. Yeah, that's right. That's the problem when you got three hours. And I think you, really, I think that first bit of advice about doing what you do well first. And, and getting some confidence and feel like, well, I've done quite well on those two questions. Now, what can I get in these other two questions, you know, and try and get your way towards 17 or 18? You know, that's that's where you've got. And you've got to try and be competitive, you know. You, you want to be feeling that like you can get to 15 on an average day, and on a good day you can get 17 and, and you, the exam might have suited you and you got there. You know, it's not a, it's not a perfect art. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much, David. Um, there's a couple of very grateful thank yous um, in the chat that I'm sure you'll be able to see. Um, and so it just remains for me to say, yeah, that was really incredible. Um, as a fellow teacher, I really enjoyed it. I love those concept questions and and some of the thought provoking um, aspects that you drew out of all of the, the many concepts that we've covered today. Um, this resource will be here for the future, so feel free to go back through play it back through and um, and share it with any of your colleagues that might be doing scholarship physics as well. Um, but really appreciate your time, all of the time and effort that went into this, David. Um, much appreciated. No worries. Yeah, it's, it's, it's my pleasure and good luck to all the students when they sit. I think it's next Thursday. Yep. Yep. Good luck cool. to you all. Hey, thank you, everyone. Have a great day and best wishes.